Hello everyone, our philosopher thinker for today is Emmanuel Kant. Now Kant was one of the famous thinkers in the Enlightenment period. He thus installed a new era in the development of philosophical thoughts. In this presentation, we will be looking at his thoughts on morality, politics and perpetual peace. Now to start first by morality. So uh, we know that people behave in a way that they call as moral. So morality exists, but how can we understand it? What does it mean to be good? Kant focuses that the only thing that is good without the qualifications is the good will. Now, we as humans, we are imperfect, but acting from the good will will make us whole. He called it the good will because it is related that you do good and you do not wait for uh, something else in return. So let's take this example. For example, you just opened a new business and you treated your first customers in a very good way. Now, whether your outcome is to get more customers or just because this makes you happy, this is not a good will. A good will will only happen if you do good and you do not look for the outcomes. Now, morality is a system of rules that we pose on ourselves and these are the results of being rational beings and uh, it is applied for everyone. Now Kant link it morality to logic and because you cannot escape logic you should respect morality and he believed that to determine whether something is right or wrong you should use your own reason, your own intellect. So Kant believed that morality and religion should be apart because if we want to look in religion for our morality we are not going to get all the same answers so and we see that because in christianity and islam there are a lot of total different principles and instead he look at morality as a constant like a mathematical sentence two plus two equal four whether you are a christian muslim buddhist or atheist now uh, this will lead us to also uh, apply what he made the distinction between things that we ought to do for moral reasons and things that we ought to do for non-moral reasons. And the distinction goes this way. I can't believe that most of the time we do things not because of the moral reasons, but because of our desires. For example, if you want money, you ought to get a job. If you want to, uh, an A, then you ought to study. If you are hungry, then you ought to eat. And this is what we call the hypothetical imperative. And these are the commands that you should follow if you want something. And this goes this way. If you don't want money, then you can choose not to work. If you don't want the A, then study becomes optional for you. And if you are not hungry, then you can choose to delay eating your meat. But he believed that in morality, we should look at it as the categorical imperative which are the commands that you must follow whatever are your desires and they are the driven from pure reasons and he believed that the moral law is binding all of us equally and we don't need religion to look what uh, that law is all about because what's right and wrong is, uh, is totally knowable just by using your own intellect now the uh, categorical imperative has four main functions. The two, uh, two most important of them are, first of all, the universalizable principle, which is that, according to Kant, act according to the maxim by which that it will become as a universal law without contradictions. And this goes this way. So let's say, uh, let's take this analogy to understand it. Let's say we are back on campus, we are taking our courses normally, and we decided to make an event to sell books. Now, you really want to buy that book X, and you know there is only one copy from it, and everyone else wants this book. You want to buy it, uh, but you realize that you either forgot your wallet or you don't have the sufficient amount of money. So uh, you notice that, that student A, who is responsible for selling these books, is busy speaking with a student B. So what you did is, you took advantage from this situation and you took that book. Is it moral for you to do this? Now, what you did here is that you actually took the book without paying for it, which is stealing. Now, whether you admit it or not, still you stole that book. And 
and uh, by stealing this book, you are making this action as a universal as universalizing actions, like which is uh, that everyone else should always steal because if you can do it, then everyone else should do it. Now here it leads us to the contradiction that Kant's talking about. And the contradiction here is that no one will say that stealing should be a universal action because uh, of our stealing should happen all the time because it goes this way if you can steal that book then i should steal it from you and you should steal it back from me and this would never end therefore Kant focuses that you should never make exceptions for yourself now let's take another example if we have a couple a partner A is lying and cheating on partner B. Now, partner A is doing as, like, as a Kantian, you should always ask yourself, what is the maximum of my actions? Now, partner A is making, like, lying and cheating on a relationship as a universal act, because if he can do it, then his partner uh, B can also, uh, can she also cheat and lie on him. And by this, uh, Kant means that if it makes sense for you, then it should be a universal law. And you should never make exceptions. And the last thing is that you should never violate the moral law, even if you think it is for a good reason. Now, this was the first uh, function of the categorical imperative. The second one is about how you should treat people. And it goes this way. Act on a way that you treat humanity as an end and never as mere means. Now, we use things as mere means all the time. I am using my device to help me film this uh, presentation. If it broke, then I won't be using it anymore. And this is fine uh, because devices are uh, made for users, but humans are made for themselves. The idea here is Kant knew that we use people all the time, but we should never use them as a mere means. For example, we are using our professors to get knowledge. I am using my sister to help me film this presentation. But the idea here as a mere means is that not to use people the same way that slaves owners use it to use the slaves as a means for the slaves owners end. So according to Kant, we are ends in ourselves and we when we are dealing with other people we should keep on mind that they are ends in themselves so they have they are uh, rational autonomous agents they have their own desires their own interests and their own goals and this goes also regarding that we should not be manipulated or manipulate other agents for our benefits and for instance like uh, cheating and lying are never okay because if I told my parents that I want money to buy new books for a research I'm working on, and I used that money to go to a party. Now, I robbed my parents' uh, ability to decide autonomously whether to give me that money or not. And this basically is a violation for Kant's second categorical imperative. So Kant argued that a proper and rational categorical imperative application will lead us to the moral truth where all agents are the same and they are equal. And this is where no God is required because if we act on the basis of morality, then we will be acting as if there is no God. Now, according to Kant, the moral laws were already found within us. We are reasonable, we have the free will, and we voluntarily choose morality. And war and peace were just found in the international society to reach the development in the state conduct. By over time, we will prone the conflict and will aim for peace. Now this will lead us to his essay on perpetual peace or the end goal where Kant took a moral approach within domestic and foreign affairs. In domestic affairs, he states that uh, we, are, we should change into a republic where the legislative and the executive have checks and balances, so no one branch can dictate injustice on the other one. And this is linked to the constitution should be moral. On the foreign affairs, he stated that the state have a moral obligation to pursue the peace and the end goal, which he called as the moral duty. 
And in terms of realist, he said that they didn't understand what is the true nature of man, which is, according to him, reasonable, uh, trusted with free will and uh, freedom, and this uh, to stand against tyranny and despotism. So he gave uh, three maxims of despotism rulers. The first one is act now, justify later, which is when it usually happen when states have legislative and executive uh, don't have a distinction between them. And states want to fulfill their interests, so they go into harsh ways and harsh means and they later justify it as at that time that was our own uh, our only option now the second one is um, if you committed to the crime deny it which is as a state you should never bl put blame on yourself and the third one is divide and conquer which is uh, a politician if he give he, he has the opportunity he must divide the people within his nation or, or in another nation uh, to give him the opportunity co to control another country and to have more political control. Now speaking about the Kantian principles, one of no treaty of peace shall be held in which there are some uh, tactically some reserved matters for future wars. And the second one is standing armies should by time be abolished totally. Now, when dealing with Kant, we have to keep something in mind that this will not bring to a conflict between politics and morality, because the realists might say that uh, uh, conflicts can arose any time. Now, Kant didn't disclaim that, but what he's saying that if we return back to morality step by step, this will soothe the evil in ourselves. Now, the last idea to end up by presentation is the Kantian trolley problem. And the idea goes this way. Uh, there are five people tied into a track and you are tied it to the other one. Now, you have only an access to only one hand. You are not fast enough to flee yourself. And the trap, uh, the trolley will kill uh, either you or the other five people. What would you choose? What is morally with you? I pull the lever and die to save the other five people or not? What would you choose? Let's have the discussion. Thank you for listening.